Live from the JSA Podcast Studio, presenting Data Movers, showcasing the leaders behind the headlines in the telecom and data center infrastructure industry. Welcome everyone to a special edition of Data Movers Podcast. It's the Greener Data Edition. So welcome, welcome. I'm your host, Jamie Scott Okataya, CEO and founder of JSA, along with my fabulous co-host, top B2B social media influencer, Mr. Evan Kerstell. Hey, Evan. Hey, Jamie. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Data Movers, where we sit down with the most influential men and women in today's leading telco and data center world, supporting our network infrastructure requirements. Um, Jamie, how are you? Really good, really good. It's crazy April already. There's so much, uh, so much going on. April, our month, our planet's month. We're excited to, to be chatting with you today. Likewise. So I see you're at home, although you have a fake background, so I won't ask about that. But <laughs> do, you, do you have a lot of technology at home? Smart technology, IoT, you know, smart applications. Are are, are you a a techie adopter as well as 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 being a, a thought leader? Uh, for sure, my my husband drags me along. Um, yeah, he's he's a, a tech guru, and so uh, ever since knowing him, actually, um, his his homes and then our our collective home uh, has been very uh, high tech. Yeah, yeah, and, and and so there's tech that really is fun and and sort of entertainment. Uh, you know, for example, I have my Philips Hue lighting, and mm-hmm. when it rains. Uh, the uh, the Philips lighting turns purple, so purple rain. Uh. Um, so you know, I, I enjoy all that the gadgets and all that stuff. But any any beyond entertainment, uh, any any use cases for your gadgets or tech that are are kind of actually for good, either for you know environmental reasons or you know energy savings, things like that. Well, I'll tell you, uh, this Grinner Data Series podcast have been giving me so many great ideas. Um, uh, both uh, Dean Nelson and Bill Clayman had had given us some apps that I'm like, I need to try out, you know, making sure I'm regulating my water usage at home and uh, energy efficiencies. So I'm excited to definitely get more green with my tech. Um, right now, I'm, I'm in baby mode. So my biggest tech probably be Nanit to making sure that my baby's breathing and sleeping well at night. That's a good use case. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I need something that keeps my plants alive in my home. So maybe oh. that's a good use of technology. Um, be- maybe self-watering. I'll have to look into that. Well, maybe our, our next guest has some ideas for tech inside the home as, as well. He's a visionary. I'm telling you, anyone here, uh, it will be our friend Wes Swenson. He is the CEO of Nova Data Centers. Welcome, welcome, Wes, to Data. Thanks for Movement. having me. Appreciate it. Well, yeah, welcome, Wes. And you know, we we've chatted before, and we'd love to get an update from you on the chapter, the content you contributed to the Greener Data book. Uh, it was called "It's Not Easy Being Green: Data Centers and Holistic Environmental Sustainability." That's a mouthful. It but is. why don't you break it down for us? Yeah, I mean, I just, I attempted to really define kind of the large spheres of environmental impact that data centers have and what we can do to remedy that, you know, pretty quickly as a data center, uh, you know, describing things such as indirect emissions, right, from our energy providers. How can we influence that with renewable energy, solar, wind, storage, and then direct emissions like, you know, selective catalytic reduction on generators, you know, when we run those generators for downtime or for testing. And then, of course, you know, I'm a big advocate of waterless cooling, uh, using zero water to do cooling, regardless of the environment you're in, whether it be uh, high desert, cold desert, uh, the plains, wherever it is, I think that data centers should really shift towards waterless cooling, either through free cool or what they call dry cooling with compressors. Um, but I'm, I'm a big advocate of waterless cooling in the in the market. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was so fascinated. Uh, by the way, guys, here's the book early preview. Wow. <laughs> I know it's so cool. It's amazing. <laughs> um, but in your chapter, 
sorry, getting back to you, Wes. Yeah. <laughs> In your chapter, um, I was really fascinated by um, how you talk about growing up in the 70s and the 80s, really influencing your view on the environment. Can you tell us a little bit more? Yeah, I'm dating myself a lot here, though I don't look, uh, you know, like I'm born in the double aughts either. But, you know, so I grew up in a time where, you know, we had console TVs at Curtis Mathis, if anybody recalls that. We had like six channels. Yeah. And... You know, so we had a pretty small world or influence at that time. And I grew up in an age when we saw Vietnam updates and then later, you know, the Cold War and Ronald Reagan. And then, you know, in, and during that time, you know, Earth Day started. And, you know, even when I was in elementary school, there was a lot of talk about stop the flow and stop the drip, a lot of water conservation and we had a lot of advertisements. I don't know if you remember the Crying Indian, you know, with... Uh, oh, Native classic. Yeah. yeah, the Native American and pollution. And so that had a big effect on me. But then in 1980, you know, I saw Cosmos uh, from Carl Sagan. And that had a really profound effect on me as a young adult. Um, you know, I just thought of the world a lot differently as earth. And then later, as he called it, the pale blue dot, our place, you know, on earth, then the solar system and the universe that, you know, we only have this one planet mm -hmm. and to really, I mean, it had a big impact on me. And then of course, you know, as we emerged from the cold war, we had, you know, more time to think about um, more altruistic things, if you will, uh, at least I feel that way. And I think the environment became, you know, a much bigger storyline, which it should have always been probably, but maybe we just never really had the convenience of thought at the time. So for me, that that's how I grew up and that was how I was influenced, but um, it had a big impact. I would say Carl Sagan and Cosmos had a huge impact on me. Yeah, yeah that's pretty deep. Yeah, I grew up with a father in a Volvo belching diesel smoke out of the back. Sure. With no seat with, with no seatbelt on, so yeah, it's, it's definitely times have changed, and it's it's brand new thinking about the environment from that time. And you know, just observing, many data centers are getting a bad rap, some deservedly so, on environmental impact. So, what what should the viewers, listeners, take away uh, regarding the current state of the art in data center sustainability, and, and how to create greener facilities? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that if you think about data centers, these are like cruise ships, not speedboats. Um, they take a lot of time to turn. Mm -hmm. They don't just flip around, right, like a speedboat. So they take a lot of time. These are really, you know, there's a lot that goes into site selection, um, the design, the build, and then the equipment of the age, right? So what we used to build 10, 15 years ago is different than what we build today. So it does take a deeper understanding, again, that these are not speedboats, um, that they take time to turn. But I think the biggest impact is that if you're doing a new build today or what we call a greenfield build, you should really be putting the environmental sustainability at the forefront of design when you're building one of these. As far as older data centers go, they can still have an impact in the, in the change out of equipment, even the slightest thing like moving to renewable energy with your energy provider. You know, we, we can be big agents of change, an influencer on the environmental side of power, um, which has a big impact. And then I think on waterless cooling, that is generally something you can change out that is not always economically feasible. I would also say that it's up to the leaders in the data center industry to influence this change before, say, governmental impact changes are required. You know, they don't require data centers to go to renewable energy today but we can take the step towards doing that. I mean, why should we be told to do that? Quite honestly, we, we should take the first steps. I don't think um, it's, it's like even, you know, a lot of emissions control in a lot of these cities, 
Some do require a selective catalytic reduction on the generators and some don't. To me, if you're installing a new generator, you should put it in. Even if it's not required, you, you should take a step. Things like that, um, I think, are really up to the leaders in this industry to take steps towards rather than being told to do it. Well said, well said. And, and really, that's uh, one of the, the big pushes I'm hoping that comes out of reading Greener Data is that this is of the industry, for the industry, by the industry, that we're taking the charge here. And we have so much ground we can cover collectively as we are, are a big percentage of that global energy consumption. Um, uh, and, you know, when I think about uh, your amazing uh, data center campus in Utah, which uh, which you opened in September last year, gosh, it's a, it's a pretty bad. Oh, oh, yeah. Wow. Um, uh, but anyway, I think of you as I don't know, sort of a poster child, if you will, for how data centers can be more green. Uh, you really did so many wonderful things right. Can you tell our viewers some of your data center sustainability uh, features? Yeah. So, you know, this was a brand new design, something I'd been contemplating for years of a really large scale facility, but of course, renewable energy as part of that component through, you know, our energy provider, waterless cooling. So we use zero water to cool the facility and we achieve, uh, you know, ratios, incredible ratios of say, you know, uh, for every you know kilowatt it takes to power a server, it takes 0.2 kilowatts to cool it. Uh, so it's very efficient on cooling. We also use ambient air. Part of the reason we selected the site, we did it, it sits at about 5,300 feet of elevation. And so we're able to use the cool winds coming in you know, from the west that hit the mountainside and come into the data center. So we use that cool air also to, to accompany the cooling. Um, we did almost three feet of insulation between the exterior and the interior of the data center. So it can work just like your home. So we have almost three feet of insulation, just the exterior walls are 14 inches thick. Again, just to, to cushion that energy consumption, um, we used low emissions interior products, recycled materials, as many local vendors as we could use. Um, we have a lead silver data center and office building, you know, so we've done a lot, um, but it goes all the way from A to Z, which is site selection to even using a lot of local vendors just to, you know, reduce the amount of emissions uh, that we produce to produce the data center. I, I even, even the angles of the data center were chosen so that the equipment wasn't south facing so that the equipment is both east and west, taking the shadows from the east during the day and the western winds in the afternoon. So a lot went into it in the design. Incredible. Well, it's on my bucket list to take a tour of the facility and, and then hang out for a Always couple of weeks well. in the, Let's in do the it, mountains, Evan. by the way. Always. All right. <laughs> but uh, until then, um, you know, here at JSA, and its clients, there's a lot of focus on greener uh, infrastructure and uh, the evolution of a cleaner data center environment. Um, so where, where are we on this journey, do you think? Are we at the beginning? We have the first or second inning? Give us some context. Yeah, I mean, I, I consider it to be at the early stages, quite honestly. I mean, if you think about it, the internet's 30, 31 years old, right? Since the Netscape browser. And so, you know, I consider anybody I meet 30 years old to be pretty young. Uh, <laughs> and, and I think the same of the internet, which, and, and really data centers are just a byproduct of that. Uh, you know, we've come a long way from just using a browser to now, you know, the internet of things and AI, driverless cars, you know, we've come a long way in 30 years. So I really consider it to be at the beginning of the journey. I don't see an end to data centers, but I do see over the next 10, 15 years, kind of a refresh of older data centers built in the early stages that just are not efficient. Uh, they don't really serve the scale in which we do today. 
that I do see a big refresh coming on older data centers that maybe they're just not worth it to refresh and it's just more efficient to build a new one with some of the new technology, especially the environmental technology. So I think Evan, it's at the beginning stages. And then let's, uh, let's push the spectrum even further. Let's talk about the continued evolution of data center operations. Do you think data facilities will be dramatically different 50 years from now in terms of sustainability within their operations? 50 years, Jamie, I can barely think about five minutes ahead of time, but okay, we'll, <laughs> maybe, maybe five years. We can. I already that. said 10, I had to go bigger. <laughs> okay, 500 no, years. I'll, I, I'll, I'll, take a, I'll take a shot at it, Jamie. <laughs> yeah, I do think it will be considerably different. Um, you know, I think that you'll see things maybe you like nuclear fusion, mm. um, hydrogen, mm. I think we could see different energy. I would bet within 50 years, we have part of this energy issue solved, um, at least in the more developed world. I could see this being solved for the most part. Um, and that could be a combination of, you know, fusion and renewables and hydrogen and things like that. I also think that we could, and I hope, you remember, we're a byproduct, data centers are a byproduct of really usage by, you know, everyone. And then the chip makers, right, that provide this, the chips to the servers that provide them to our clients. My belief is that we'll see rapid development on more efficient semiconductor technology. And we'll see lower heat volumes mm -hmm. and we'll see more efficient chips over the next several decades to where I'm hoping that the energy used by a data center becomes really low. I mean, we went from a phase where, you know, 10, 15 years ago, it was two kilowatts per cabinet. Today it's 10 to 15 kilowatt average. So we're doing more in the same footprint, but, you know, I really do think that eventually those semiconductors will become more efficient and you could see data centers use a lot less energy, not only for the servers, but also for the cooling of those servers. Wow, amazing. Maybe even data centers could produce energy one day. Maybe That's we crazy. could, and we could certainly <laughs> heat some homes, I can tell you that with what we produce. But I agree, Evan, I mean, yeah, it's, who knows, but I do think it will be dramatically different in 50 years. Well, that, that's fascinating, but enough shop talk here. We'll, we'll, we'll switch gears a little bit, our rapid fire fun wow. facts section about you where we try to embarrass you or, <laughs> or, or no, just find out something okay. interesting about you. I'll do more of your best. background. All right. Um, you know, I, I'll, I'll start with the greener data chapter. You know, you pulled a Kermit lyric out of the hat <laughs> there for for that. But for those who remember the Muppets, which probably aren't many people watching, sure. what was your favorite Muppet? I've got to go with Oscar the Grouch because yeah, he's, he's pretty good. I like the contrarian, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I vote for the underdog. So I've always been, always had an affinity for Oscar. Oh, funny. That's, I would have never, I would have never peered you with him. <laughs> Never. Uh, but hey, what would you give? Uh, what would you say to your younger self? What, what advice would you give? I would say, what's the worst that could happen? <laughs> Basically, right? I mean, if you take a chance, like what's the worst that could happen? You know, in business, especially in taking chances, taking risks. I mean, what's the worst that could happen? If I could tell myself that more often. And also, I think when you look up to people, you know, they put one sock on at a time like anybody else. And, you know, we're all of the same carbon-based material. Uh, and a lot of times, you know, it's just luck of the draw. But mm -hmm. I really think what's the worst that could happen if you try? Well said. Fun, fun. Okay, hobbies. What, what are your favorites? What do you do when you're not building green data centers? Uh, probably just outdoors, anything outdoors, hiking, biking, snowshoeing, fly fishing, you name well, it. Well, you're in the right place. That's I am, I am. I'm in the heart of it. Yeah. So, yeah, I would say anything outdoors. Can't go wrong in Utah. No. 
Um, but now what companies do you admire for their sustainability efforts? You know, I, I'd say at least in, you know, my world, Apple, I'm really, um, you know, I'm amazed at what they do with their facilities and the surrounding communities. I mean, you know, I've seen and driven by a lot of their locations and I'm just gobsmacked about the amount of solar and shading and just, just really even, even down to uh, a lot of times data centers can be quite ugly, let's say. Um, they do a lot for the aesthetics of their data centers and around the community. So I'm really appreciative of that, that kind of detail. I mean, a lot of times to me, that is, you know, it's, it may be 10% more cost, but it's like 80% more thought. Yeah. Um, you know, the way, cause I do it myself and I know what it takes to make something look easy like that right but it does take a lot of forethought and i'm i'm probably most appreciative of what they do as a company yeah, yeah i love the recycling they do as well it's just yeah. amazing to see that machines and the processes and in action very impressive uh speaking of which we're we're, we're traveling a lot more uh well, give us some advice of a place to visit in the world that you've you've loved or one of your favorites i'd have to say it's rome i I love Rome. History. Yeah, I love Rome. I love uh, I love the art. Uh, it's just such a it's an incredible city in the fact that it's modern. That you know you have the Roman Forum when you drive by. It just is really like the coolest city. I've found everybody there to be extremely friendly. Um, you know, I love Rome. It's it's one of my favorite cities to go to. Mine too. I love that you said that. <laughs> well, you're biased as an Italian. I know, American. I know. <laughs> my my daughter's middle name is Capri. So. <laughs> okay, all right, see? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> all right, I'm going to give you a last one, easy one. But what is okay. one book that you would recommend others to read? <laughs> <laughs> well, other than greener data, Jamie, of the Bible? The plug. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I'm a huge fan of Count of Monte Cristo mm. wow. in fiction. Okay. It's a it's a huge read. Wow. That it is it is one of those books. When I start it, I can't put it down, and I read it at least once a year. And I just love I love that book. Um, and then nonfiction, probably one of my favorites is Demon Haunted World by Carl Sagan. Um, mm. Just about science and myth and and how we as humans have kind of adapted a lot of myth and, and really there's a scientific explanation for it. But um, fiction wise, yeah, I love Count of Monte Cristo. Total, total escapism for me. Love so. it. Well, thanks for joining us, Wes. It's been great hearing from really the cutting edge of innovation on sustainability and data centers. Uh, you know, it's so impressive what you're doing. I look forward to keeping in touch and uh, touching base on, on current trends. It's been my pleasure. And, and, you know, uh, I want to say, guys, check out our other Data Movers podcast with Wes as well, where he really gets into uh, some of the details of the design. The, the, you can tell he's a, an innovator and a, a designer, an artist, a renaissance man like we heard today. Uh, so you can do that at jsa.net slash podcasts. Um, and, and go ahead and look up uh, this one, which will be uh, airing, of course. And, and we also re release episodes every other week on Wednesday morning. So check us out. Awesome. Thanks awesome. for having me. Uh, it was a pleasure. Well, uh, in, yeah, always a pleasure. And follow us on Twitter at Jay Scotto and Evan Kerstell, and we'll engage you more there. Thanks, everyone. And thank you, everybody. Uh, again, thank you so much, Wes. Uh, your team at Nova, amazing. Um, and uh, everyone, uh, please be safe out there. Happy networking and think green.